Um, can you guys hear me at the back with this? Yeah, can you hear? Alright, good. Um, I've got a name stand that's in the title. I'm hope not freaking everybody out. Still see a couple of familiar faces, and I've spoken to most of everybody here um, who know me already, so that helps. Um, still people coming in, but I've only got half an hour, and I've got quite like a lot of slides that I want to churn through. So, um, welcome all, I think. A um, bit of housekeeping, it's actually not 45 minutes uh, as it used to be. It's actually 30, so I'm going to speed up. Just ask um, uh, questions as we go along. And this, uh, I hope, I've still got time for Q&A at the end, and otherwise I'll be here afterwards. Um, I'll be doing a bit of introductions. Um, I want to talk about how to, yeah, determining what standards you can get rid of. How to get people to agree on stuff, which ties into the second bit. And um, I'm going to take a bit of a detour. And I'm going to wrap it up with actually scaling um, removing standards even further. Um, introduction, this is me. Um, I have a day job. I work at National Australia Bank and I work in the standards team. If you would have asked me five years ago, or if you would have told me five years ago, I would be working as standard team. I would have yeah, not believed you. But here I am working on it. And uh, I believe we had a massive success at NAP and this is the basis of uh, what I'm doing now. I also have my own company, Sparkling Software, that um, helps people remove standards pretty much. I've got uh, 12 years in IT uh, experience. Uh, I started typing this over again actually. I was starting to build up a little bit of, it, of um, yeah, scale, I suppose. Six plus years experience in um, process improvements, and I moved over from Netherlands four years ago. A little bit over there. So that's where the accent comes from. So don't call me German, I'm Dutch. Right, cutting to the core of it. Um, why is usually standards library really suck? Uh, like I said, if you've told me it's five years ago, then I would not have believed you. Um, even the word standards make people, yeah, ripples across your back, right? This is, I think, is why, why I never liked standards groups, and particularly the people who work in standard teams. Um, usually they just have loads of big documents that you have to fill in, even though it doesn't make any sense to your project. Um, the stale standards, broken links, all that sort of stuff, because they tend to be document machines, that they, they think creating more documents is a good thing. Uh, so, but they, they don't think about it. Every document they create, they also need to maintain. So you end up with broken links and and it's hard to find stuff. I've never found any process library that you can actually find what you need. There's one good thing is an Eclipse Process Foundation, but even that is sort of yeah, I think it's 15 years old, and uh, yeah, I, I never got really got a hang of it. And like I said, people people think creating standards, sticking in SharePoint, that's the end goal, and then they send an email around, guys, from now on, everybody's going to do this. That's not how it works, right? It's it's not the, it's actually the start of a journey. Getting people to agree is saying, right, now it's the journey to actually start changing people's behavior, to actually start doing this. So there's a lot of work that needs to go on behind the scenes around it. So the flip side, you didn't, probably didn't see this slide coming. Why I do think standards are actually a good thing. So I think it's a very good thing that we have a, a standardized notion of what a meter is or a kilo, or a liter, I think that gets us uh, quite far. If I, yeah, if I have to express a distance, I can tell you it's uh, 100 meters, and you would know what I mean. We don't have to argue about that really yeah, little low level stuff that just everybody knows. Um, text forms, I thought of an interesting one. Luckily we have standardized text forms. I can't imagine that being free text sending everybody their financial information to the tax office every year in free text. That would be an interesting experience for them. So I think there's particularly good reasons why we why standards could be good. Because it saves us reinvention of wheels and reworks. And if I just have a really good test summary template that would actually work for me, I would see that as a benefit. But nine out of ten times, they're not. So there's two ends of the spectrum. One side is that standards are fantastic. We have a meter, which is a great thing. And the other end is the bloated yeah, requirements documents that nobody reads anyway. And there's somewhere down the middle 
there's a balance where we think standards are useful or not. And this is sort of what I, this is my own personal opinion, why I think it's complicated and why nobody's really nailed this yet. Because they can be really specific or really generic. If it's really specific, it's really useful for my team, but it costs a lot of maintenance and I probably need 15 different test summary report templates for every team because it's that specific for that particular team. It increases the maintenance of the standards team so they won't ever do that. So they make it really generic. But if it's really generic, yeah, what's the point? I have a logo at the top and a footer down the bottom. That doesn't give me much benefit. What's the what's the purpose then of reusing the template instead of just creating my own? So everybody just grabs their own that they've used and go with that. Um, and even to make things more complicated down the bottom, it's actually it depends on the experience of the people working in the company. Um, it depends on how much juniors you have. It depends on the maturity, of the the organizational culture as well. If people just being pragmatic about everything and don't care about sense in the first place, then yeah, there's different paradigm as well. So it's a lot of things influence where the sweet spot is on how many standards you need and want and is useful. Does that make sense? Yeah, people nodding at the back. Yep, still awake. Not falling asleep after lunch yet. <laughs> right. So it all depends on the organization, really. And I think that's why stuff like CMMI, they, they had a decent crack at it. CMMI is highly documented and it worked really well for military organizations because they're in this end of the spectrum and CMMI is really tailored for this end of the spectrum. Agile is probably made more over here, sort of, sort of in the get lost with your standards kind of area um, because it's more about being pragmatic, more about, but it, it really depends on the structure what you're doing. At NAB, for instance, I know for a fact, um, there are agile teams who tend to be more in this area, but the enterprise nature of our organization is more in this area. So there's a balance that people need to make on a per case basis. So how do we agree on the level of standardization that we need? That's where I specialize in and um, what we really want is to create an people in the organization um, to not do this tug of war thing every day where one group of the people who are usually in governance and say now we need more standards and the agile guys um, think at the other end of the spectrum say now we don't need any standards. Um, you want to get them into, uh, into collaborative mode to come into the, the right side of the screen, get them on in the same rowing boat and get them in the same direction. And that's a trick because then all of a sudden we're talking about people anymore. We're not talking about academic stuff where you can put formulas in and everything that we do is just another template. It's actually talking about people and it's also makes sense for people need to do this stuff. So people need to start talking in a way that makes sense because I don't want the whole organization involved in just talking about standards because we won't get anything delivered. If we're just talking about a template, then seriously. So this is what Carnegie Mellon came up with, early 90s. Another CMMI, I'm probably at an Agile conference talking about CMMI is probably cursing, but um, CMMI actually doesn't say you need to produce documents. CMMI is talking about good practices. They talk about source code managers. I've just sat in a meeting with Brad and pretty much all he talks about was the same thing that Carnegie Mellon was talking about early 90s. Why? Yeah? Sorry, CMMI and PII. Yes, I'm going to talk about PII okay. and I'm going to do CMMI right now. So it's um, a capability maturity model, yeah, improved something. Capability model. Um, it was re heavily used in military standards, really, to, to say they, they divided all companies in five levels. Uh, level one you get for free. Level two is sort of if you defined your stuff. Level three is actually executing it, sort of the yeah, sort of the average company would do that. Level four, oh, you're pretty good, and you're actually using the metrics out of your company to improve yourself. And the five is your actively your top of the range. What happens in the late 90s is that the sales guys 
got the hang of what it means to be CMMI level 5 because that means I can sell my consultants for more. So what they did is they bought a in company in India who was level 5 and called the whole company level 5. And that sort of stuffed up really the intent of them. What they said at the beginning though is if you create process improvement teams that help you um, do this collaboration, so you create an improvement team for Microsoft, for Java, for test, for BAs, for, and each has a lead, then all of a sudden you create this collaboration across competency, all of a sudden the BAs talk to the architects, you talk to the devs. This is becoming this SAPG, this is all 20 years of academic stuff, I'm not going to tinker with abbreviations. Um, this is how uh, a really good way to get people to collaborate. There, there are companies like Boeing, like um, there's a whole list of stuff, uh, companies who have great results on the back of this. So getting people to talk about these standards and how much do we need, I think is a really good idea. So get, just get rid of all your standards, start creating internal communities and get them to talk to each other and you don't need a lot of people to start doing this. We all know this, the, you all have to use your suspects in an organization. You usually have a couple of really good developers or a really good architects and these guys they hang out on, on the coffee machines, they, they clutter together already. So it's really formalizing those and start having the cross-competency organization. We were very lucky at NAB because management really bought into this. So we got a lot of dollars on the back of these conversations and the management now really trusts the insights of this SPG. This is how I suggest you could set this up. You have community of practices, which are large and people just hang out and do presentations, pretty much what we're doing today um, in a corporate environment. Out of that, there's usually um, a couple of people, small group who is very passionate you can get to really get in a room and really start thinking about making improvements and that's what's becoming more formal and they get the SPG to sign off on stuff so they meet every fortnight and they tick boxes in um, it gets a little bit more boring you go up I must admit but this is the SPG is also where the really good conversations comes in we have I've had a really good conversation whether the testers should own defects or the ITIL guys uh, what they call known errors because known errors pop up in production as well. Do we need to feed it back into test when we do a new release? And then how does, how does that work? That's where those discussions happen, where they need to happen as well, because there was a really big gap in our knowledge. And there's also, even though Carnegie Mellon did this 20 years ago, I reckon, with a little bit of imagination, I must admit, <laughs> I'm sure honing it in a little bit, but the Agile Manifesto, in essence, still applies to that. I did have to scratch out working software a little bit, um, and uh, to change the customer that we're delivering to. But instead of working, so individuals and interactions, that's what it comes about. It's not about putting a standard into SharePoint. It's about talking to the people, what it means to them, how they need to do their work differently. It's about quality and productivity to our business users, and that's why we do it. If everybody starts writing their uh, test summary reports from scratch, then we're wasting a lot of time. If everybody just uses their um, uh, the tools in a fairly similar way, then at least uh, we don't have to do as much handover, and that's where quality and productivity comes in. But that's our end result, it's not the document. Documents are still there, so it's Agile Manifesto, we value the left over the right. The customer collaboration is it's customer in this case are actually senior stakeholders. It's it's the, the various competencies that just need to work together instead of yeah, doing this document based conversations and emails and doing that sort of paperwork. So I'm I'm sure wanting a little, little bit here, but I'm hoping I get away with it. And it's about responding to change as well, being pragmatic about it. This is not a harsh and fire. If it makes sense on your project to not use a standard, then yeah, don't do it. That's really it's Sends that to help you, not to prevent you from doing work. But if you if you are making the exception, then you need to know what the implications are, what the risks are of not doing it, and that's usually where it comes down to as well. Because people, yeah, uh, me included, I'm going to stick my hand up. I don't really don't care um, if I'm going to do this. I'm going to focus on this, and I don't want to read through all this stuff uh, of the implications. There might be implications of not doing it. I'm just going to go with the flow. 
Um, so I think it's, it's, it comes down to being pragmatic and yeah, uh, scaling down the library to really make it useful again and um, job based that help people instead of hinder them. Now, this model scales to an enterprise level. I've done it at small companies. I've, I've done it at probably five or six companies now. And it works on really small ones, but it also on massive ones. A map I would call pretty big. Um, and uh, the model scales. You can have multiple communities across different business units, even though uh, they might be in Bank of New Zealand, might be UK, might be here in Australia. Um, the collaboration model still remains the same. Um, and you do want to have, you do want to cater for the fact that they might be doing stuff a little bit different in New Zealand than we do over here or in the UK. There might be different laws, there might be different regulations that they have to do stuff different or just want to do stuff different. Um, but there's it's good reason. If people feel that something isn't working for them, ditch it and yeah, make up their own ones that are working for you. Don't be afraid to delete standards. So it comes down to this. Having one standards library where you just say uh, but if you're in the UK, then yeah, forget about this. Or you have to do this because you get your ass kicked by the tax office if you don't. So it comes down to, in a pr really pragmatic format, it comes down to having a document with just sections in there saying, oh, here, Department 1, then you need to do this, this custom bit. If you're Department 2 or organization, sub-organization, you need to do Section 2 over there. But it's allowing for that as well. That's really the, the essence of it. Getting people from the ground up involved, getting the BA community in New Zealand to say, now we want this section in there um, because we need to. Yep, fair enough. Stick it in. Happy days. That's really what it comes down to. Does that make sense still? I'm going to take a bit of a detour. Um, and I need to check time. 35. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm still, I think I'm going all right. Uh, yeah, detour, like I said. It's a bit of personal personal frustration. So I've done this at, uh, like I said, about six or seven companies now. And um, the first thing, the, the so I set up these communities, right, internal, and get a couple of devs together, and a couple of BAs, a couple of testers. So the first thing that testers do, they start and write a TSR. So everybody get in a room, and they all collect the TSR and stuff. And they spent two or three weeks discussing on which bits goes where, and how important it is, and... The devs, what they do, is they turn around and they look for coding guidelines. For some reason, they always go to coding guidelines. I don't know why, but they just, yeah, they do. Java guys, they, uh, Java guys, they go to Sun, and then they tinker with Suns for some reason. And the Microsoft guys, they really don't know, and they just build their own. Um, so, yeah, there's a bit of personal frustration that I think, why that sort of stuff, why don't we just have it somewhere? So I, I, when I did it yet again at NAB, I had a look and there's 20,000 out there, all stale. So whatever you see internally in enterprise organization, the exact same thing happens out there. Even RUP or stuff like that, it's heavily used. It's still very much, yeah, it goes out of date really quickly. So this is where we keep reinventing wheels. As an organization, I think, if I get a sense for every TSR that people have created themselves, yet another template for, for everybody to use, then, yeah, I think I'll be a rich man. I'm picking on TSR, by the way, but there's a lot of other stuff that we keep reinventing. Um, so I, yeah. It's about some stuff we should just, as an organization, we should just know, like laws of gravity. These guys probably haven't thought about it really carefully. Um, it's about the boiling point of water, for instance. That's pretty common knowledge by now. Yeah, it's, it's a really complicated one. I never, to be honest, um, never really understood it, why space-time is actually curved, but um, everybody does recognize uh, this equation. Well, most people, tying shoelaces, pretty common. Um, using computers, by now? Uh, yeah, not very on the topic, but seriously cute. So, in IT, I, I really couldn't be bothered if I set up another community who's going to look at coding guidelines again. Um, same goes with test summary report. There's some software tools that we can just use. We don't have to think about stuff anymore. Um, use case templates, we've been there, done that. 
continuous delivery pattern, we know sort of the high level pattern, what that looks like. So I've been thinking for a while, and I had a look at Wikipedia, and these guys, they seem to be on the ball, because there's not a lot of reinvention in Wikipedia going on. There's people debating it, and some articles go back and forth, I think, um, depending on the year. Odd years, one article, and the even years, the other. Um, but it seemed to be have a, a sort of a pretty consistent feel to it. So I thought, what if we had a Wikipedia for IT stuff? So people then turn around and say, well, I spoke to people say, yeah, but IT is really hard. We're special. I tell them, well, we might be unique, but we're not special. I mean, there's a lot of other areas that's really complicated. Um, it's hard to get consensus on stuff. And if we only had a, a collaboration framework that get us to those agreements, then we might get us somewhere. So I've been thinking, hang on, Melbourne has already communities. I remember David uh, leading one of the marks. Is it, what are you leading, the SharePoint? Um, XDDN. So XDDN, yep. Yeah. Mahesh um, is running the Microsoft community. Uh, Mark Peterson, who's done the morning session, is running the test community. Um, what else is there? Uh, Greg, obviously, is running the BA community. How <laughs> can I forget, Greg? Um, so we already have the communities. So I can build this to build up that Wikipedia. And that's what I'm doing. I have, across companies, I'm setting up those communities um, to form exactly the same infrastructure as I've used in those other companies to come up with standards, to stick it in a wiki for everybody to use. Does that make sense? Is that still? Now, the interesting thing is that um, I've never seen this done before. So I'm either going to fail miserably or I'm going to change quite a lot in the IT industry. It's, I don't think there's a middle ground. I'm either going to nail it or I'm going to fail miserably and find out why the other initiative didn't work either. I don't know. I'm going to find out. I, I seriously don't know whether it's going to fail or not. Okay. Just a question. How would this differ, say, for example, when consortiums come together multiple companies, multiple organisations, Standards, like standards or is, is, is this the same approach or is it different in some way? Uh, it, is, um, it, is sort of, it is sort of the same, uh, but this is really from bottom up. So what you find with consortiums coming together is you just lead a Martin Fowlers and the, um, the, the, real, the, the, the guys like me in process teams. If I sit in one of those meetings, then I tune out after five minutes. It's, it's not the stuff that... We, I, I spoke to Tefleen. She's done the ISO standard. In fact, last week I spoke to Tefleen Mun Murdane. Forgive me if I misspell the last name. Uh, but she's on the testing ISO standard. It's being drafted now and it's going live in a couple of me months or so. And she couldn't get them to agree that testing requirements is a good thing. She couldn't get it in the ISO standard. But she was saying, but surely having a tester read the requirements in, in story form, in use case, in whatever form it is, is a good thing? I said, no, nah, it's not testing. So that's sort of the point that I'm trying to make. I want to make this pragmatic. I want to remove all the crap that the ISO standard has in there and say, all right, what is standard? What, what, sorry, what is testing? And what does testers actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? And how can I make testing, testers' life easier? Yep. You're, still, you're still producing recognizable patterns, documents, bodies of work, but it's a less formal, more pragmatic, industry-grounded approach rather than... Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. It's about, uh, I'm going back to the Agile manifesto, my tailored, <laughs> my version of, come on, see how many slides we've gone through already? Um, it's about quality and productivity. It's about the people 
Who, uh, who in this room has read the ISO st any ISO standard? Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, <laughs> 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 I, I was not expecting anybody to stick their hand up, so... Um, but I, I, actually, I need to stand by red tablines, but yeah, I was meeting with her, so it seems respectful to do so, but... By red, I mean skip and never want to do it again. Yeah, now, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, actually, you, yeah, that would be my, if I ever ask that question again and somebody sticks their hand up, I'm going to ask it, would you read it again? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, nah, but it, that's really what I mean. It's, it's, there is useful stuff in there, but it's, it's not stuff you use every day. No, no, so, my Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, the, it's, yeah, um, I think what this, what this will do is people will recognize stuff that they're not using and they get annoyed by and they'll start removing it. That's why I feel removing standards is probably a good thing, so I'll just have the core that actually people are using and maintaining. Um, so yeah, um, I have a Melbourne SPG um, by now. I've been doing this since December. I've had a bunch of meetings and starting to get off the ground now. Um, there's seven different, there's people from seven different organizations now uh, participating and there, uh, three of them are now looking to get the ALM library installed in their own uh, on-premise. So I think I'm getting some traction. But it doesn't stop at Australia and Melbourne. Because these BA meetings, we don't just have them in Melbourne. We have them in Perth. We have them in Sydney, Brisbane. Well, I think we have them in Brisbane. Um, so this model doesn't just scale from organizations to Melbourne. It actually scales up to Australia. And it scales up to global as well. There's a guy in Norway that I used to work with over here. He got really passionate, and he's now setting up a Microsoft community in Norway. And the stuff that he talks about is exactly the same as we're doing. Microsoft is the same everywhere. Java is the same everywhere. Testing is the same everywhere. It doesn't really matter. There's slightly nuances, but it is still the same stuff that we're talking about. So if, if he comes up with coding standards, then we say thank you very much, and we'll use this going forward. Thank you very much. People always say, yeah, but companies, no, no company is the same. Well, you're absolutely right. And there is this scale from standards are awesome and uh, get lost. Uh, so you do have to think about how to tailor this. Uh, but I think the 80-20 rule applies here as well. If you focus on the 80% that is the same, then instead of starting a template from scratch, I can now start with the 80% that is right for me. The rest will just leave out and we'll sort it out later. Or not, then we just leave it blank, saying, yep, this is what you need to put in yourself. Um, I also had a really good look at Apache, how Apache does this. Not just Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a really good model of governance and how to review stuff before it goes in, and peer reviews in particular. Apache is really good at tailoring stuff. Um, so the open source world, what they do, if you don't like something, you just replace it with your own module. Um, so I thought of, yeah, it's not that high-tech, but I thought that was a nice picture of replacing stuff, replacing one module for the other. Um, this is, for instance, uh, a high-level architecture for the Apache web server. If I don't like a particular module, I can just replace it with my own, and I can use that in my organization. The same thing I've done with the ALM library. It runs off files. I'm going a little bit techy here. And I've checked it into GitHub. The same, so I treat the standards library as source code, and all of a sudden, all the open source stuff just applies. If I want to grab a copy out of the ALM library, I just download it, install it in my local uh, environment. If I want to tailor it, I can do that, but I can also push my changes up to um, the mothership again, just like Apache has done for the last 20 years with their web server. 
it also means that everybody's contributing some way or another uh, to the single library. You can choose to contribute back. You don't have to. As an organization, uh, I'm pretty sure NAM won't push a lot up. <laughs> oh, I already pulled out a couple of things, actually. So, um, so what happens is the, insta the ALM library, you can just get them installed in your own um, environment, and you can just cherry pick whatever you like out of it. And on this, once you have it, you can start contributing back into central repository while you keep your own library. But it also means you can get updates from everyone. So how cool would it be if we just had somebody, up if Microsoft releases .NET 5 in year down the track, somebody writes new coding guidelines for .NET and they just get spread out across all organizations. Yep. And here is the FX cop file that describes that standard. Yes. So if it, if it is something that can be automated, then just the automation right in there in the GitHub. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're spot on. You're going to love what I'm going to show later on. Because I've got exactly that. Oh, another, you mentioned FX cop? Well, oh, is yeah, no, yeah. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So, um, sorry. Can I. Yep, yeah, I'm on stolen track. Oh, yeah, the one thing that and you can customize it, obviously, for your local uh, organization, but then if you customize it, you can't get updates anymore. You need to merge those. Now, source code merging, there are plenty of tools out there to help you do it, and everything is file based, so you can just yeah, merge to your heart content. Um, fingers crossed, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, call that. I, I'm advocating getting. An instant library, come talk to me afterwards if you're interested on how far I've gone and what we've already done in only the eight months that I've been doing it now. Um, and yeah, um, if you do feel, if you have really good job aids that you can think uh, other people would benefit from it, then um, get one and start contributing as well. So the advantage that you get um, out of using it. I think is um, so. It, it I really get annoyed when I go on in any intranet in a company and I search for something that n I know is there and still doesn't come up in search. And it's just because they've implemented the wacky thing in yet another tool, um, Eclipse Process Foundation. There's no search tool that can index that. So if I stick it in Eclipse, then there's no way my intranet search is going to find it. So what's the purpose of a standards group? putting standards in that nobody can find. You actually have to open the tool and then navigate to it. Um, this is with usability, with discoverability in mind. You get notified when the communities come up with new standards. Am I running out of time? I have. Five minutes. I'm running into... Actually, I am running out of time. Because we should have been out here five minutes ago. Yes. There's, nah, there's a there's a fishbowl session upstairs. Um, I think. Nah, I think I'm all right. The rest is uh, screenshots of what I've been doing so far. Um, and um, yeah, the rest is screenshots. So to wrap up. Uh, contact me afterwards if you're interested in a either participating or getting your own local instance. Um, there's already a lot of content in there. Uh, we're starting to build it up at a rapid pace because I'm, I'm getting more and more people involved. There's about 40 people now involved in actively contributing and having conversations on how to get um, more and more content in there. Um, and it will only grow. So this will only get faster and faster the more we get in there. Um, I'm talking about uh, metrics like defects, um, uh, metrics, continuous delivery, um, agile waterfall standards are in there. Uh, people role description, what are the top 10, top 10 things you would need to do as a dev to be, consider yourself a bit of a um, respectable software engineer, I suppose. That is the stuff that I'm already putting in there. 
um, then we're only going only to go faster from here. Talk to me after it. Um, these are my contact details. Uh, contact me on Twitter. Um, oh, it's actually my nav one. I should take that out. But, um, or next week, come to my website.